I invite you to please stand. Our gospel reading is from Matthew 6. This is a continuation of the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus said, Beware of practicing your piety before others in order to be seen by them, for then you have no reward from your Father in heaven. So whenever you give alms, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites in the synagogues and in the streets so that they may be praised by others. Truly, I tell you, they've received their reward. But when you give alms, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your alms may be done in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And whenever you fast, do not look dismal like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces so as to show others that they are fasting. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face, so that your fasting may be seen not by others, but by your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust consume and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust consumes and where thieves do not break in and steal, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. This is the gospel of the Lord. I invite you to please be seated. I'd like for you to just, for a moment, think about your favorite movie or your favorite book or your favorite story. Think about your favorite big story that you have, all right? Now, once you've figured out what that one was, I want you to think about your favorite moment in that story. Again, whether it's a book or a movie or a play, what is your favorite moment or your favorite scene from that particular story? All right, you got a picture? Maybe it's a favorite line. Maybe it's that moment when the happily ever after ending finally comes into focus. Whatever it is, just keep that in mind. And then my next question, what was the opening scene of that movie or book? If it's a book, what happens in the first three pages? If it's a movie, when they first come off of that initial title screen, what's going on? How about the second scene? Do you remember what happens next? Or the third? I was thinking about this the other day. Bridget and I were watching that Tom Hanks film, Bridge of Spies. The climactic scene occurs on a bridge at night during what is hoped to be a transfer of prisoners. I was drawn to the opening scene, however. It was a normal city street, and then they went into a bustling but not out of the ordinary law office. And it wasn't until a couple hours later and many, many turns of the story that we found ourselves on the bridge for that key and important scene. Think again about your favorites. Can you predict your favorite moment from what, from what you remember at the beginning of the film or the book? And then can you name all of the intervening plot twists and turns that help the story from one place to the next? Can you think of all those plot points that add up to that moment, which is your favorite? Most of us can't. We'll always skim over some of the less significant, maybe less exciting moments, the ones that fail to capture our imaginations, even though we know that there are a few hours or several hundred pages of novel that surround and and maybe even lead up to those key favorite moments of ours, those things tend to fade into the background. Scripture is no different. We have our favorite places. We have our key verses, our life verses, those things that we turn to as our regular go-tos. We have those stories that we can retell over and over again from memory because they mean so much to us. But we also know there is so much more to this story that either we can't remember or we've never seen before. And so it is with the portion of our story from Matthew's Gospel that we read for today. What I just read is a portion of the Sermon on the Mount, a favorite spot for people to go when they're seeking to understand how Jesus would, would have his followers live. 
We read these instructions about prayer and fasting, about giving, and about setting our hearts on the right things and, and having our priorities properly ordered. And the teachings just before these are those comforting words, those beatitudes that remind us that those who are meek and oppressed and brokenhearted, those will be the ones uniquely blessed by God. And when we hear these things, we join the crowd of people surrounding Jesus, don't we? Eagerly listening to these words of instruction and comfort and hope as they come straight from the lips of the Son of God. And we are in awe. We're in awe of his wisdom, of his compassion, of his elevation from everything that's mundane and normal as we see him set apart. And as we admire him, as we study his teaching, we become more and more aware of the great distance between who Jesus is in his perfection and who we are in our imperfection and our shortcomings. And today is, as I was telling the kids, a day to remember that God is God in all of God's infinite perfection, and we are not. Before we get to the point of despair, though, before we talk ourselves into believing that we are absolutely powerless and completely incapable of any sort of imitation of Christ, let, rem let me remind you that there's a lot of truth of Jesus' story that didn't make it into the book. There are a lot of pieces that didn't quite make it in here. And that reminds me that there's actually some truth into a, in a very old joke that I'm sure many of you have heard about a teenage boy who wanted and expected a car for his 16th birthday. He asked his folks to buy him a car, and they agreed, but they did so with some conditions. Told him to clean up his act, get a haircut, make yourself presentable when you're leaving the house, those sorts of things. And the son, in all of his cleverness, said, but you know, the Bible says Jesus didn't have a place to lay his head. I bet he didn't bathe every night. And you know, in every single picture I've ever seen of Jesus, he had really long hair, too. Yes, replied his very clever parents. And everywhere he went, he walked. <laughs> everywhere he went, he walked. Jesus spent a lot of time walking. And during that time, he prayed. He spent time with his own thoughts. He discussed matters of life and faith with the disciples. He mulled over the scripture that he'd studied as a boy. He had a lot of time to wrestle with the teaching that he would share. See, I don't believe that all of the things that he taught came to him in flashes of divine inspiration. I think the truths of the universe were revealed to Jesus over time just like they are to us, through all of these internal and external interactions and conversations, through his prayer time, through what he learned in Scripture. As with anything worth having, I believe it took time for Jesus to come to grips with the wisdom of God. And it happened over the course of a lot of miles and a lot of hours. The season of Lent is considered a time of discipline, a time when we either give up something or, or take on something with an eye toward self-improvement or, or health of one of kind. Sometimes it's just simple gamesmanship, just to see if we can do it. This tradition of adding some form of discipline has its origins in a desire to become more Christ-like in our behavior, in our hearts, in our habits. We have a goal in mind, but at various points, we all know there are times when it seems like that goal is much more distant than we can manage. It seems like Jesus is way too far from us. Christ's ways are far too alien from our own ways. We get discouraged. We give up. We make exceptions. We find a loophole, or two, or three. That's when we need to remind ourselves. Everywhere he went, he walked. 
We never expect to come to the end of a journey immediately after we've taken that first stumbling step. We take one step, then we take another one, and then we take another one. Sometimes our steps aren't perfect, but we continue to take them. And sometimes we look back and we see how far we've come. And other times, we look forward to remind ourselves of where we're going. And that's when it seems discouraging. But the most important part of this walk is that we don't lose sight of the Savior who continues to walk with us through each of those faltering, stumbling steps as he encourages us, as he teaches us, as he leads us, as he loves us. So whatever it is that you're inspired to do during this important season of the church year, whether it's being a part of the book study, maybe it's picking up one of the Lenten devotionals and making that a part of your day-to-day -day time with God, maybe it's seeing them online or subscribing for the text messages, whatever it is, I pray that you'll move forward toward that lofty goal to discover how much more each of us are created in God's image, to realize just how deeply you are loved by God, to understand the power of the Holy Spirit to transform each and every one of us daily through little steps, sometimes through great big steps, to look, to sound, to be more like Christ. It doesn't happen overnight. There is no express lane. It takes a journey to get to those places. The question is, what will your first step look like? Amen. I invite you to please rise as we sing together.